Welcome back to Be The Change Podcast with me, Stephanie Howlett, CEO of Diversity NL. Have a listen as we explore real life, vulnerable topics on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Become awakened, create culture of inclusion, be brave, have impact by being an ally. Explore how you can be the change that you always wanted to be. Welcome back to Be The Change podcast. And today we have a most famous guest of ours, Michael Bach. Thank you so much for joining us. I truly appreciate it. I'm gonna get into a little bit about your bio because it's, you know, to me, it's truly fascinating. Uh, so nationally, internationally recognized thought leader, subject matter expert on diversity, equity, and accessibility. And I'm pretty well sure there's a lot more than that we're gonna talk about today. Um, founder of the CCBI. I know now that your own, um, you're your own self. Um, you have, you know, Michael Bach, like you're a public speaker, keynote speaker. Um, you know, you have a couple of different, uh, you can see your books behind you, you know, Birds of All Feathers and Alphabet Soup. Um, you are a husband and you also are uh, a fur daddy. Is, is that, right. is that your words? Maybe. Uh, absolutely. I have two fur babies right. who yeah. are not babies anymore, but they are mine. Yes. Or Absolutely. I'm theirs. Take your pick. I think you're theirs. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, I'm very uh, excited to talk to you and, and to learn, I guess, a little bit more about what you're doing these days and how life is going. Like, how's that looking for you? So Thanks let's start me. a little bit about, yeah, let's start a little bit about what you're doing. What's uh, what's on your radar and uh, what have you been up to? Yeah, so I left uh, CCDI back in November of 2022. And I really wanted to focus on innovation in the inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility space. Uh, so really looking now at different projects that will help to move the conversation further along. And um, it, you know, I got to the point where I didn't feel like I could innovate anymore in that existing structure, not to say that CCDI can't innovate. It's just that they have, you know, 50 employees, all of whom need a paycheck every week. And so they end up focusing on what the client needs today, not what the client doesn't know that they need. And mm -hmm. so I want to focus on what they don't know that they need. And that's where my energy is going right now, along with speaking engagements and writing other books and different projects. But that's pr primarily where I'm focused. Amazing. So it, I call that the the unknown unknown. It's, it's like, you know, people don't know what, what you don't know. Yeah. And there's lots of education, of course, out there for people. So let's tell us about a little bit about some of the education and some of the things that you do for uh, for different organizations and companies. Well, yeah, I've done a lot of training um, and I'm I've moved away from training completely. And I'll tell you why. Uh, largely because it's not having the intended inf effect. And at least in its current structure, where, you know, we go in, we deliver a two hour instructor led training, or we roll out a 30 minute e learning, and people participate it and they enjoy it. But then they go back to their daily lives and they're not thinking about the next piece of the whatever. Um, so now my focus is how do we make that learning experiential? How do we make it day to day? How do we? integrate it into um, their daily lives as employees in whatever company. Um, because if, if we want to change behavior, we have to change our tactic. And everyone goes to learning as a default, but that's, that's not enough. So I think of learning as a daily occurrence, like reading an article in the paper or watching a TV show, um, uh, listening to a podcast. There are lots of opportunities to learn that don't involve the classroom. And I, I really think we need to focus more on that aspect of learning rather than the instructor-led training. Now, I, not that that's not important, it is, um, but we have to take it to the next level. And that's really where I'm I'm trying to put my attention now is how do we take it to the next level? Okay. So I guess looking at 
training plus other intentional things because it's kind of like pride month you know june or july when a pride whenever pride month is in, in your part of the world you mm -hmm. know people put up the progress pride flags trans flags you know different flags to say like hey you know we you know we're celebrating right we're accepting those sorts of things but we want to make this 365 days a year not one day that you're going to march in the parade or the yeah. day that you're going to fly your pride so what are some thoughts around some different things that organizations can do, businesses can do on a daily basis? I think it's an excellent point, Stephanie, that, you know, on June 1st, everyone's logo on LinkedIn will change mm -hmm. and on to have the pride flag integrated into it. And on July 1st, everyone's logo changes back. And as I've always said, still going to be gay in July. Absolutely. And, and pretty much every day of the year. Um, so. I think the visibility is important. If we're just talking about 2SLGBTQI plus inclusion, visibility is very important where the pride flag needs to be up 365 days of the year because as the invisible minority, and I'll put that in air quotes, we are looking for a sign that the environment is safe. And if you only put it up in June, then does that suggest that I'm only safe in June? Um, and what is the message to you know people who are not members of the 2SLGBTQI plus communities in terms of you know the treatment of 2SLGBTQI plus people the year round? So that symbolism is really important. Um, I think uh, um, integrating the entire inclusion conversation into everything you do is where employers need to take this work because a lot of times it's very surface it tends to be a lot of performative stuff. Like I use the example of the NHL, um, of which I'm a big fan. Unfortunately, the Leafs got knocked out. We can, you know, shock and awe on that one. Um, but I'm thinking about the whole kerfuffle with uh, pride jerseys mm -hmm. and the different teams wearing them and not wearing them and, uh, you know, that's performative. That is not making hockey more inclusive. So employers, I'm encouraging employers to move away from that performative. Not to say that that symbolism is important. It's important. But what's more important is what do your policies say? Um, if someone experiences discrimination in any form, and I'm not talking just about 2SLGBTQI plus people, but people of color, people with living with diverse abilities, whichever, if anybody experiences discrimination, what's the process? Uh, you know, is someone, do you have a zero tolerance policy? Is someone uh, terminated as a consequence of that behavior? Um, you know, if it, it has to integrate into everything you do as an organization. Your marketing, um, you know, it's going beyond the potluck lunch to, you know, looking at every aspect of your organization through that idea lens to understand if you are truly an inclusive organization. Pride Month is important. It's Asian Heritage Month uh, right now, it's important. Those are important things, but that is not changing behavior. So uh, I've had some, I guess, people say to me, well, we're not going to put up the pride flag because then we'll have to put up every other flag. Ah, uh, yes. Mm. Thoughts on that one? I think it's a lack of understanding of the purpose of the pride flag at that point. First of all, I think that's a nonsense excuse. Mm -hmm. That that's just um, subtle homophobia and transphobia. Um, I, th you know, we've had this in Ontario. Uh, um, a couple of municipalities have used that excuse for not host, whole, uh, putting up the pride flag. You have to understand that we, as a community, um, are looking for that symbolism because it's about safety. And if you don't think we're unsafe as a community in the United States, this year alone, over 500 pieces of anti-trans and anti-2SLGBTQI plus legislation has been tabled or passed. We're having debates about 
a trans person's rights to have medical treatment. And that's in 2023, which is just absurd, right? We are, as a community, we are under attack. And if you don't think that can't, if you think that can't happen in Canada, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And and so that symbolism is a sign to, it's like a beacon of hope that we are in a space where we will not experience discrimination and where we, where we will not experience violence. And it's why leaving that pride flag up all year round is important. Um, hoisting the flag for, I don't know, uh, Bangladesh independence. I'm not saying that people from Bangladesh haven't experienced discrimination or violence in their lives. They absolutely have but they're not invisible. And so it is a symbol of hope. Um, and frankly, I think, you know, a few other flags would not be a bad idea, but the pride flag in particular is, is one about visibility and safety. Absolutely. And every year, like that gave me cold shivers, by the way, just the, the thoughts of our rights can be stripped away so easily. Like you and I wouldn't be married anymore. Yes, because right? because because you know that potential could be stripped away from us, not because of anything we did, not because of who we are. Like, well, yes, because of who we are, but like it's not because of a choice that we made per right. se. Exactly. You know, like you know, we're part of this community because we're part of this community. Um, you know, we didn't. I certainly didn't choose to be. You know, queer. Uh, right? I did not okay. fill out the <laughs> application. No, no, I didn't. That sounds good. Yeah, sign me up for some queerdom, right? Like that didn't happen, right? So it was just like this. This is who I am. So we're living, you know, our authentic, authentic self. If you want to use that language. Um, so the thoughts of you know, as Canadians, that our rights can as easily be stripped away as you know, you know, our American counterparts. Like that's just it gives me whole shivers and a whole lot of fear, to be honest. Yes. Um, you know, and safety is massive amongst our community. Um, you know, a lot of times we may not feel safe um, in different areas, different places. Um, you know, I just looked at a, the other day, a, a privilege checklist. Um, just looking at that, it's just like, wow. Like when I start to fill it out and start to, to check, like really some of the, the pieces of who I am, um, I, I came to an understanding of I'm not as privileged as what I thought I was in certain areas, you know, like, because, you know, the safety was there. Um, well, yeah, privilege is a lot about know? safety. Yeah. It's not it's not necessarily about the color of your skin and your your sex assigned at birth. It's about whether or not you are safe. Um uh, there and you know, I think people minimize privilege to the point of of personal characteristics like race and gender. But the reality is that um it, it's about whether or not you're safe. And whether yeah. you can walk down the street holding your your significant other's hand, uh, whether you can exist in society with a fear of, uh, of for your safety or not, that's privilege. Absolutely. And that's some of the things I was coming to the realization of just kind of deeper for me, like, what does this look like? Um, and, you know, myself, and my partner, were going through it going, we're safe, we feel safe in certain places and not safe in other places, depending on where we're to. Um, you know, you know, we live in Newfoundland and Labrador, which is a beautiful community, beautiful province, but we do not hold each other's hand yet. It, it's interesting because when we go to Toronto on church street, right. We feel safe. Um, don't know if that's, I don't know what that is, but it's just that I, I feel that, that this is, this is a intentional gay community, um, that there's more safety yet. I know that violence does happen as well. Certainly target violence and, and, and just violence in general happens, but just yeah. that, how we feel about ourselves when we go to different places and different cities. Like, you know, we have to think about travel. Are there yeah. certain countries we shouldn't travel because now we're not wives anymore. We're friends. Right. Right. So, so that whole intentionality and around safety pieces is, is massive, you know, with our community and all the different pieces. Even, you know, I just got back from drag con in Los Angeles and Yes, I'm that gay that I went to drag on. Um, I love although, it. Amazing. Although it's, it's mostly straight women, <laughs> which is just the irony of it all. Um, but, you know, there were protesters out front of drag con. And for a moment there, I 
was concerned about my safety. I had to think, okay, am I safe? Where's my exit strategy? How can I get out of this moment if I need to? But talking about travel, you know, my husband and I, uh, he's American. Every time we go back to the States, we usually travel together, you know, up to customs, both passports, because we are married. And, mm -hmm. but every time, every single time I step up to that customs officer, I think, is this person, and it's usually a man, going to be homophobic? Are they mm -hmm. going to ask us some stupid questions? Are they going to exclude me from entry to the country, which they can do because of my relationship? And I don't know. And that's really what true inclusion is all about, is I shouldn't feel that. I shouldn't have to be concerned about whether or not this moment is a risky moment for me. Um, but it it always goes through my mind. Never mind going to some place like the Middle East or the African continent. Most countries on the African continent, homosexuality is illegal. So I'm not going. That's not on my travel itinerary. But I'm just talking about countries where it is legal, and that where and that we're even having a conversation about where where my identity, where our identity is legal. That's not something straight people have ever had to consider, that there is a country where you are outlawed because of who you love. That's privilege. That's definitely privilege. And it's, it's, it's deep, but it's something that we have to think about all the time, which truly amazes me when I, when I talk to folks about traveling and who are you going to? And, you know, I'll ask people, so, do you, you know, is it, you know, is it safe for me to go there? And they're like, what do you mean? Like, you can travel. I'm like, no, you can't. So there's certain pieces of the world that we can't comfortably travel in because if they found out that we were part of this community that, you know, technically we could be jailed or killed or any of those yeah. things uh, could yeah. happen to us that, that aren't pleasant, uh, which, is why, which is why a, a lot of folks are coming to, um, you know, Canada to, to be a safe, you know, refuge, um, you know, a place to call home that is, you know, that's safer and certainly I think somewhat more accepting, you know, despite the fact that I think in Canada within the last couple of years, like we've had over, I think we're we're almost close on 300 deaths uh, due to uh, parts of our community being killed, you know, yeah. intentionally. Yeah. Well, and the rates of of hate crimes mm -hmm. are are higher than we've ever seen. And there's a petition before Parliament right now. I think it's still open, um, but there are an open petition to ask the Canadian federal government to uh, essentially um, create. Um, I don't know what the exact wording is, but it's uh, um, rules within the immigration uh, uh, system to allow trans people from the United States to seek refugee status here. I, let, let's say say that sentence again. Americans yeah. becoming refugees yeah. in their own country. And I signed it, and I will happily sign it anytime it comes wow. beca because – uh, trans people are under attack and they do need our support. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's massive. Like, think about it. It's, <laughs> it's huge. massive. I mean, you know, our neighbors, like, you know, I, I saw the, the open invitation or, or lack of invitation from Florida saying like, Hey, if you're thinking about coming here, think again, because we're no longer safe. Uh, there's a lot of hate going on. We're passing bills, um, you know, pass it on to your loved ones that maybe you should spend your money elsewhere. And, and we have. Like we've, we've said, like, Absolutely. we're not going to Florida, right? Like there's places you can't go uh, that we can't go anymore. And that was one of the places that we, we kind of enjoyed going. Yep. So like, you know, now we're on our bucket list. And to be honest, when we looked at it, places like Portugal, um, I had no idea. But when you start looking oh, at yes. safety in different places and acceptance, it's like, wow, I had no idea. So like now, you know, getting informed. Well, Portugal made a choice that, you know, it, Portugal was never a business destination. It was never a place where they, you know, that their economy has been pretty poor for a very long time. So they rely heavily on tourist dollars. And they're a country that has made a conscious decision to say, we're going to be open and accepting. Um, and it's not because of the goodness of their heart, it's because they want the tourist dollars. They want the retirement dollars. You know, I was somebody who was going to retire in Florida, uh, mm -hmm. not so much anymore. So we've made the decision that we're not retiring in Florida, we're retiring in California, um, but Portugal is an option that people can now consider to say, mm, you know what, maybe I retire in Portugal, uh, I get everything that I would want 
uh, out of Florida, except no Disney or IHOP, which I think we can all live without. <laughs> right. Very good points. Definitely. I mean, you know, uh, you know, I I'm sure there's a in Portugal, there's other places we can all certainly visit that uh, is going to be more comfortable potentially than Disney or IHOP. So, you know, yeah, all good. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about barriers that you may have faced within workplaces or what that looks like for us. You know, that's an interesting question because I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been around for a long time and done this work for a long time. So I've seen barriers that were mm -hmm. the conscious objector, the fighters, you know, people who were actively working against inclusion. And we still, you know, we still see some of that, but now I think the biggest barrier is uh the fence sitters the people who aren't consciously objecting but they're not actually helping make change they just think that doesn't affect them right i'm i'm not a member of of any marginalized community so i don't need to uh do the work it doesn't affect me it doesn't impact me and that i think becomes the biggest barrier is apathy you know that that sense of oh this doesn't you know i'm not a person with a diverse ability i'm not a person of color i'm not whatever and um so they think it doesn't impact them and so they end up doing nothing they are not part of the solution but i believe very strongly that the only way that we um move towards true inclusion is with everyone involved because everyone has the ability to create exclusionary environments therefore everyone has the ability to create inclusionary environments but people have to understand that that's their job that they have a role to play in that and i think there's a whole lot of apathy out there i think the vast majority of people are are simply you know, fence sitters that say, eh, this doesn't really impact me. So why should I bother? Mm -hmm. That's the biggest barrier I see right now. Apathy. Yeah. I, um, I guess talking to a lot of organizations, I talked to them about benchmarking and knowing your metrics. And I'm always shocked that most organizations don't know their metrics. They, no. They've never looked at really truly who's in my organization and like, what are we doing for our employees? Because we know that now the talent acquisition is, that's a in HR practices. Those are top of the market things. And it's a whole lot of money when you're constantly hiring and rehiring and recruitment and retention, all those things. So looking at your metrics, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I listen, I'm a, the first person to say you need your data. That's mm. my background. That's where I come from. If you don't know your data, it's the spaghetti technique. You're just throwing stuff against the wall to see if it sticks. Mm. Um, metrics now is viewed as table stakes. If you look at the Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Benchmarks, the GDEIB, mm -hmm. um, data collection is, is in the bottom um, quartile of kind of the, the, the hierarchy of, of this work around inclusion. And it's that's just table stakes. You have to know who your people are. And, and that has a ripple effect to so many things. Who applies to your jobs, who gets hired, promotions, advancement, uh, pay. Um, you can't understand where the bias is at play if you're not willing to collect the basic demographics of um, um, who, who they are, right? Uh, it's, it's just fundamental. It's... Uh, it amazes me that so many employers still don't have that information. They think that because they have sex and age, which is required under every labor code on the continent, that that's somehow enough. But it's not even remotely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder sometimes if it's, if I know, then I can't unknow. It's one of those things. If I ask... And people say like, hey, we're not doing a good job on our policies when it comes to harassment and discrimination. That's like, oh, dear, 
like we got we got work to do let's roll up our sleeves and this is might cost us you know it's it's i wonder if it's one of those sorts of things oh absolutely but the reality is the problems aren't there because you don't ask the problems are still there not asking just means you don't you know you've stuck your head in the sand and you're pretending the problem isn't there it's still there and it is as much as it's going to cost you something it's already costing you something the cost of exclusion, and we don't talk enough about this, about how much it's costing employers not to create inclusive environments. I have a video up on my YouTube channel um, that's I, it's called The Cost of the Closet, and it's a very sort of back of a napkin look at what employers are paying to not create inclusive environments just for the two SLGBTQI plus communities. And there's a Canadian version, a U.S. version, and, and a British version. And in essence, in if I'm remembering my numbers correctly, in the United States and Canada, it's costing employers over a trillion dollars a year to not create inclusive environments. And that's just the two SLGBTQI plus communities. So if you add in communities of color and communities of ability and such, we're talking trillions and trillions of dollars every year wasted because employees don't feel safe. They don't feel included. They don't feel engaged. They're not going to be as productive. And if employers could, I think, if employers look at it from this perspective, what is this costing me? What is inaction costing me? Rather than what is action going to cost me? Look at it from that perspective, and suddenly you're going to find that employers will say, oh, we can find some money for this because it's going to save us money in the long run. Um, I, I think about a client I worked for I, that shall remain nameless to protect the guilty, um, but I, I believe it's in Germany. They have uh, legislation that requires employers to hire a certain number of people with diverse abilities or disabilities. And if you don't, you have to pay a fine. And the fine is very, very high not small dollars. And this one client was paying somewhere in the range of about a million and a half euros a year. And wow. my response to, and it was in their budget. They actually had a line item in the budget to pay this fine <laughs> because they didn't want to do the work of, of uh, hiring the people with diverse abilities to eliminate the fine. And I said, okay, you give me a million and a half euros over two years, um, and I will make that disappear for you. And we did, because we taught people what a person with diverse ability was. We educated, we created environments where people with diverse abilities could succeed, and they hired people with diverse abilities, and they stopped paying the fine. But for years, they had been paying over a million euros a year not to do the work. That is asinine. It's just a bad business decision. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those things that if a CEO is wasting a million plus euros a year on something that they can change, their board of directors should be saying, you need to fix this because we've got a million euros going out the door. But because it's with a marginalized group, people just think it's too much work to deal with. Oh, we can't. It's too much. It's costing you a million euros a year. And let's let's do a translation to Canadian, right? I think we just purchased yesterday 1.47, 1.47. Yeah, I was going to say it's about a yeah. million and a half. Yeah. It's, it's one yeah. to one and a half. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, if you were wasting a million and a half dollars a year, a million and a half. I don't need that much to fix the problem. But because it is from a, a marginalized group, we just don't, we think, well, we'll just spend the money on it. Like, it's just amazing to me that people think in those terms. And to come back to my points, in case people think I've missed the plot, it, you know, if we look at this through the lens of what is inaction costing us? then suddenly we see how much money we're wasting 
not just leaving on the table because that's a whole other conversation, but money we are actually spending not to create inclusive environments. I think that changes that mindset and moves us towards, okay, we're going to spend this money and we're going to save this money. Absolutely. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's one of those things that really baffles me when I'm having conversations with CEOs and HR folks. And I think the thought process is always, this is, this is going to be massive. And I always go to the place that you did. So it's like, what's the cost of me now? They're like, well, I don't understand. I'm like, well, I go through the whole retirement, you know, the, sorry, the hiring recruitment, retention, like all these things, safety and, you know, and psychological safety and, you know, all the things you've talked about. Um, and at the end of the day is like, it, it's costing you. You just, you just don't see it. Right. So until you start putting it to paper, of course, because a lot of organizations, like you said, don't know their metrics. So if you don't know your metrics and you're not keeping track of who's exiting and having those exit interviews to actually find out, like, where are people even? Like, are we that bad? Like, you know, what's our culture? So talking about organizational culture, that's another thing of, you know, how do we create safe spaces, safe organizational cultures, you know, for people from all different backgrounds? Yeah. Well, and it comes back to the table stakes of data. If you don't know you know, your people's gender and sexuality and race, et cetera, mm -hmm. then you can't look at your data and say, how many people are leaving the organization from this group? Do we have a higher turnover rate amongst people of color? Mm -hmm. And if we do, why? But if you don't have the data, then you treat everyone as a homogenous group mm -hmm. and you're missing the point. And people will leave for any number of reasons. Um, and, you know, the, there is certainly the potential that the reason why they're leaving is because they experienced some form of discrimination and they're not talking about it. They're not going to mention that in an exit interview. Mm -hmm. But if you start to look at the data through that demographic lens, you can start to uh, ascertain whether there's an issue that is related to those demographics. Yeah, Absolutely. So hopefully, you know, those listening will start to look at, you know, what is it like for us? You know, what is it like for, for employees? Um, thoughts on employee resource groups? You know, I'm a big fan of ERGs, um, but and I'm, there's an asterisk beside. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have seen in recent years, employers abdicating responsibility for their work in inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility to their employee resource groups. And I, I, I think it's important not to misstate the purpose of those groups, that, um, yeah, they have a purpose. They're an important part of, of a, an organization's idea strategy, but they are not the be all and end all. They are volunteers working in your organization to make it better. I repeat, volunteers. So um, first of all, I think ERG leadership should be compensated in some form because they shouldn't be volunteers in an employment environment. I think if we had a conversation with labor ministers across the country, we would find that they would agree with me on that. Um, but we um, also um, uh, beyond just compensating them, we need to make sure we're not putting too much pressure on them. And I'll give you an example. So I was working with this client recently and they were putting all of their eggs in the ERG basket. They believe that that's the solution. And it was putting a huge amount of pressure on the leadership of those ERGs to address issues which are corporate issues and should not be addressed by volunteers. Um, it's, it's, they're an important component as long as they're managed and dealt with properly. Um, I, I liken it to sort of thinking of them as the cherry on top of your Sunday. Um, so if you have ice cream on its own without the cherry, it's okay. It's still great ice cream. Um, 
but cherry's nice, right? Cherry's nice. Like, okay, that's an extra. I'm now wanting ice cream if anybody else is. Yeah, um, and that's how I liken ERGs to an idea strategy is the idea strategy is the ice cream and the ERG is the cherry. If you don't have the ERGs, the, the strategy is going to still function on its own. If it's the other way around, I think it, it's a recipe for disaster. Mm. Yeah, so I guess in, in, in a lot of the things I've read, research I've done, the, the organizations I've worked with, accountability, right? Like accountability has to lie, I would think, with leadership, with those in charge. Walk the walk, folks. Walk it, right? Talk it, embed it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like depending on your HR folks to lead absolutely everything when it comes to idea. Like that, that it, it's, it's no go. So looking at like, you know, accountability has to come from the top. Um, you know, and getting by, by people buy in when it's like your leadership is, you know, is preaching this from the hills, people are going to buy in, right? Yeah. Um, as opposed to when you have um, HR folks that are saying, we've got issues and like, we need to do training and all these sorts of things. And of course, then it's who shagged off, who did something wrong, right? Where did something go away with our organization? Because it's then it's kind of a blame game. It's like, we're doing this because someone did something wrong, as opposed to leadership really taking responsibility and accountability. Um, for saying like, hey, yeah, we need to do this because it's not just the right thing to do. You know, it's, you know, the engagement, it's, you know, treating people with the respect that they need, creating safe spaces. Yeah. And financially, we do better when we have those diverse teams. 100%. Accountability yeah. starts at the top, ends at the top, lives at the top, has to live at the top. Yeah. That's where it belongs. And when you have CEOs and executive directors and leadership teams of organizations kind of abdicating that responsibility to other people in the organization, that's a bit problematic. You know, would you uh, abdicate responsibility for a major merger or for, you know, your stock reporting? No. CEOs take responsibility for that. Well, if this is really that important to you, it needs to start at the top. Absolutely. What are some, because I know folks are always looking for some like takeaways, like is there a few takeaways that you can give people that might be listening? You know, what are some like genuine things that you can do within organizations to either get started or to move some different things forward? I I'll say this all the time. What's your business case? And that may seem, seem simplistic. And some people may say we're past the business case. No, we're not. We're not past the business case. Women still make 76 cents on the dollar. You know, the data, the the rate of unemployment for people with disabilities is double that of people uh, who do not identify as living with a disability. We're not past the business case. If we were, we wouldn't have the issues we have. Um, and I think every organization should have its business case that says, this is why it matters. This is why it's important to us as an organization and be able to speak that uh, and share that really genuinely um, in order to uh, reinforce why it's important. Uh, and, and I would say, avoid the language of it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. First of all, of course, it's the right thing to do. But the problem with saying it's the right thing to do is it assumes everyone agrees that it's the right thing to do. And that's we're far from that. So we and it, it i think it infer it it actually shames people who disagree with the whole conversation to say you're wrong and i think we need to engage those people and i say that's the second takeaway um is we need to engage everyone in this conversation and help them understand their role in it and why it's important and and how it can help them and why it will be good for the business um you know, this is not about isolationism. It's not about us versus them. It's about everyone. Um, so creating those spaces where people can share their feelings honestly, and you can have a discussion about it. I've always said that, you know, creating space for conversation is important. It's important for the people who are feeling marginalized and discriminated, but it's also important for for people who are from the majority, which is traditionally straight, white, able-bodied men, um, to say, you're able to share your feelings, even if they are in 
opposition to anyone else in the room. Because only when you express those feelings and those beliefs do we actually have a conversation with about them. And can we have a respectful conversation? It's not yell at one another. This isn't a, you know, meant to be a conflict. Let's just have a conversation and, and see where it goes from there. Yeah. And I know a lot of people have difficulty engaging in some of these conversations because they're, they're difficult to begin with. Um, people don't want to write mistake. Um, like I said, they don't want to be shamed. But I think people, most people want to learn um, and want, or want to understand different perspectives and point of views. I'm glad you brought up the, the straight white males because I think they have a tremendous role to play when it comes to you know, this work that we're involved in. What, what's your thoughts on some of that? 100%. We're not getting anywhere unless straight white able-bodied men let us. That's the truth. Mm-hmm. And particularly in the North American context, um, if you look across leadership, the vast majority of leadership in this country uh, and in the United States is straight, white, able-bodied men. So they need to understand the value of this. They need to understand why it's important. Um, they need to understand what their role is in this work. You know, all of these things are are critically important. Um, it's it's, this isn't, you know, inclusion isn't something we're going to be able to do without them. So, you know, we need to engage them in a conversation. We need to help them understand that we need them. Their role is critical in creating inclusive spaces. Um, yeah, it, it, I mean, historically, when we look at this work, it has very much been about excluding straight white able-bodied men because we felt they were in positions of power and we, you know, we needed to get around them. But that's not going to work. That's never worked. What we need to do is help them understand why this is going to benefit them. You know, lowering your voluntary turnover rate, increasing engagement rates, access to new communities or customers. Like there's just so many potential benefits. They need to understand why it's important to them. Um, but if we try to uh, do this work without them, we're not getting anywhere. Absolutely. A, a friend of mine who's from the back, Black community um, says, we don't need allyship, we need accomplice, accomplices, which Absolutely. I find fascinating yeah. because it, it brings it to you another level. You know, the point there is that I'm doing the crime, you're with me too, right? Like you're yeah. you're just not stood by me. You're, 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 you're technically, you're with me, right? right. We're, we're raising the flag together. You're with me, um, you're protecting me. Um, if something happens, you're speaking up for me and out for me within rooms, right? Within powerful decision-making rooms. And that's the whole point of accomplices. It goes past the whole allyship piece. Ally yeah. is great because you're going to raise the pride flag. But, you know, if you're an accomplice, technically you're leading up all year round. The, the, the differences, there's quite differences between that. Yeah, that's that's very, that's a, a wonderful analogy. And I agree with it completely. I don't want allies. I want accomplices. I want people who yeah. are... You know, Thelma and Louise driving off the cliff together. Oh, yeah. I don't need you waving at the sideline saying, good luck. <laughs> no, thanks. I need you in the car with me. Um, Are you buckled it, up? <laughs> uh, of course, safety first. As you're going over a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's it, that is so uh, critically important that, um, you know, we need our complices to be right there with us. And and I think, you know, the reality is the percentage of people who are conscious objectors to this work is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the more people who stand up in allyship as our accomplices, the message will be sent to all of those people who are 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 the fighters, are still fighting, to say. You are getting, you know, you're alone in this battle. You may be loud, but you're in the minority. Um, and I think that in itself would be a great statement. Absolutely. Um, I know you talk a lot about it, and, and I usually ask this question up front, but it's, um, it's a bit of a playful question of what's your superpower? Oh. Uh, my ability to consume a lot of wine. No, um, because <laughs> uh, that's that, that superpower is going away as I get older. Like, you know, I, I think my superpower is the privilege that I experience 
as a cisgender presenting white man um where i have aspects of my own diversity that uh, are part of marginalized communities as a gay man as a person who's gender nonconforming i live with two different disabilities but i look like one of everybody else i look when i walk into a leadership team meeting i look like them and you know, when anybody sees the whole diversity training on their calendar, they're like, oh, God, I, what can I do else other than that? But then they walk in the room and they see me and their back goes down just a little bit. Because they see like, your nails. So they see my nails, which are pride, <laughs> pride, 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 pride. I, if I do this, you can see them in the right I order. I love it. I love it. Um, but it makes them feel safe. It makes them feel like they're in a space where they can be heard as well. And I think that's really important. I think everybody needs to be heard. And we can have a discussion about people's feelings. And you can dissuade some of the misconceptions, um, you know, the the myth busting. But if people have their back up, they're, you know, if they they walk sitting in the meeting and they've got their arms crossed and they're looking all grumpy. You know, they're closed off. They're not going to hear anything you say. So I think my superpower has always been my ability to kind of get people to uncross their arms and listen to what I have to say. You may not agree, and that's okay. You don't have to agree. But at least I can get you to hear the information that I'm relaying, and hopefully it'll get you thinking. And I've had people come up to me years after I've given presentations to them. And I remember one person, one gentleman in particular came up to me and said, I really disagreed with everything you said, and you gave me a lot to think about. And I've thought about, and then, you know, he was now saying, I have become an active ally for different communities. And so that's, that's always been my superpower is I'm I kind of in disguise. Love it. And how about your kryptonite? Oh. Ah, oh, my kryptonite. I care too much. That's mm -hmm. that's the worst part. I mean, I, I don't do this work because I'm expecting to make millions of dollars. I'm not going to make millions of dollars, so let's be honest. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, surprise. I do this work because I genuinely care, because I care about other people's experiences in society that I want them to be able to do their best and succeed. And it's, you know, so if I have an employer that doesn't listen to my advice, and not that every word out of my mouth is a jewel, but at the same time, I do know a bit about what I'm talking about. And sometimes they don't listen to me and I see how they don't succeed at what they're trying to achieve. And that, I take that a little too heart, you know, and I think, oh, I didn't succeed there. I didn't get them to understand what success would really look like. I didn't help them understand their business case, whatever whatever the the failing I come up with is, that becomes my kryptonite. And it's hard work. It, it truly is hard. is hard work. Yeah, it's very um, hard. Because working with, for instance, large organizations that their cultures are hundreds of years old sometimes, um, getting that shift, even we know even the smallest 10% shift is massive. Um, and organizations think by an education session, it's like, Ooh, we've done the work, we're, we're there, right? Like, so that, that I, I think really showing uh, or having that conversation up front is like, hey, like, yeah, we can do an education session. Um, people get a bit of learnings, but what are you doing next? Like, where does that yeah. go to next, right? Mm -hmm. Like, now let's dig in, let's do the hard work. The session is great. We've had great discussions, people are engaged, and then there's nothing. So then what happens, of course, you go back to the way that things functioned. Well, we had a great session, you know, some applause for you, and here's your recommendation. Um, but then, you know, what what's next, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is the it's ultimate massive. question. It's what is next. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, any other pointers, tips, things before we close? I, I think you nail it on the head. This is hard work. It's work. It's heavy lifting. Um, I think if you expect 
uh, to do nothing and for change to occur. That's sort of like getting a gym membership and not going to the gym. Nothing's going to happen. So you have to be willing to really do the the heavy lifting. That's the biggest thing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. I truly appreciate always getting to see you, getting to have a conversation. It's if folks pleasure. would like to hear more about you or would like to read some of your fantastic books, how can they get in touch? They can go to my website at michaelbach.com or they can connect with me on social media. I'm at the Michael Bach. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks so much for being with us today. Comment below, subscribe, connect with me at Stephanie at diversitynl.com or on LinkedIn. Be the change.